From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Ballots of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. President Biden warns Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu a major ground operation in Rafah would be a mistake. And the leaders agreed to staff-level talks here in D.C. as soon as this week. We'll discuss with Aaron David Miller of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Former President Trump floats 100 percent tariffs on cars from China. But it's the word bloodbath in his remarks in Ohio over the weekend that got everyone talking ahead of primaries in that state and others tomorrow. Pollster Frank Luntz joins us this hour for more. And we're just four days out from the deadline to avert a partial government shutdown with a dispute over homeland security and border funding raising the risk that the clock runs out. As is so often the case here in Washington, Joe, it seems like we're going to take it to the last possible second. Yes. Midnight Friday, of course, is the deadline and it may very take very well take that long or even longer to get funding across the line. Well, that's true. It seems like every Friday lately we do this, but it could be a little bit different this time based just on the clock on the calendar, Kaylee. They've pushed it to such a late hour now that while we await text uh, for a bill that could fund the government, there just might not be time for lawmakers to have a chance to read it and pass this. So we could be talking about either a shutdown this weekend or a very short-term CR. We'll have to find out in the next couple of days. Yeah, we will learn more over the remainder of this week, just as we may this uh, remainder of this week, learn more about how exactly the U.S. and Israel are yeah. communicating as it comes to what's happening in Gaza and Rafah mm -hmm. specifically as staff level talks may happen by the time the week's out. Yeah, I guess that opportunity unlocked in a phone call today uh, with Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu it was their first in about a month. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan talked about it in the White House briefing room earlier today. Here he is. I would say it was very businesslike. Each of them recognized that we are at a critical moment in this conflict. They share a common objective that is for Israel to prevail over Hamas. And uh, they have a different perspective on this operation in Rafa, and they went into some detail on that and had the opportunity really to elaborate each of their respective views um, in a full-throated way, in the way they always do. Joining us now for more are Bloomberg's Nancy Cook and Michael Shepard. Thank you both so much for joining us to start uh, this week off as we think specifically about how the week started in geopolitics, Mike, with this phone call between Biden and Netanyahu following uh, some remarks that Netanyahu was responding to from the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer last week calling for elections in Israel over the weekend. Netanyahu called that inappropriate how important is it that not only they talked for the first time in a month, but they want their staff to talk even more? Does that signal that the relationship is still functioning or that there's real trouble in the relationship more so? I, that's a great question, Kelly, and I think we're going to find out more later this week about just how functional this relationship is. The key thing that Chuck Schumer said uh, last week may not have only been the call for elections, but he said that Israel had lost its way under Netanyahu. And that may have been the signal to Netanyahu's government that, wait a minute, maybe we are not connecting anymore with Washington in the way that we want. To be clear, the U.S. concurs still with Israel's desire to target Hamas, which has been labeled a terrorist group by the United States and by the European Union. But it is growing increasingly concerned about whether Israel and specifically Netanyahu's government has a plan. What is their exit strategy? And specifically, this full-scale invasion of Rafah that has been talked about, the humanitarian cost there could be incredibly high. Well, uh, Netanyahu uh, talked about that speech uh, from Chuck Schumer on Sunday morning television. Here's the prime minister on CNN with his reaction to what Chuck Schumer said. What he said is totally inappropriate. Uh, it's inappropriate for uh, uh, to go to a sister democracy and try to replace the elected leadership there. That's something that Israel, the Israeli public does on its own. And we're not a banana republic. This is a, a wake-up call to uh, Senator Schumer. The majority of Israelis support the policies of my government. If Senator Schumer opposes these policies, he's not opposing me. He's opposing the people of Israel. Michael, he says it's inappropriate. It certainly is unusual 
uh, for the Senate leader to make a call like that openly. It wasn't endorsed by Joe Biden, but I believe he referred to it as a good speech. How rare is this? It's extremely rare. And also you have to consider that Chuck Schumer has been a longstanding ally of Israel. He is the highest ranking Jewish elected official in the United States. And he gave this speech from the Senate floor. He didn't just put a statement out on X or, or send a statement on paper from his office. It was a real moment. And he was trying to send a signal. And part of the signal he is sending is one that's coming from the Democratic base, which has grown increasingly concerned over the humanitarian yeah. toll that we just talked about. There are more than one million displaced people now in Rafah. The UN today is warning of the possibility of famine across Gaza. So Chuck Schumer is seeing this and hearing from many progressive Democrats that something has to stop. Well, and I'm sure the same goes for President Biden as he considers his own uh, re-election effort in 2024. And, of course, there also is the consideration, Nancy, of the man that he is going to be up against, who has secured uh, the number of delegates needed to be the Republican nominee. And that is Donald Trump. Of course, there was a lot of buzz over the weekend about remarks he made in Ohio talking about a bloodbath if he were not to win re-election. Talking specifically, though, about that being true in the auto industry and touting this idea of 100 percent tariffs on all cars coming from China. A lot of people got caught up on the word selection that he was using, but there was also substance in terms of the outlining of trade policies he may pursue in a second administration. There certainly was, and I think a lot of people who watched the Ohio rally really took the bloodbath to mean that there could be potential political violence if he didn't win. His campaign really has had to spend the last two days cleaning up that remark and trying to clarify it and say that he was talking about you know, sort of the hollowing of the auto industry. Um, you know, it wasn't entirely clear to me exactly what he meant. Um, I do know that it was very windy that day and the teleprompter wasn't working, and I think that that made some campaign officials that I spoke to over the weekend nervous, Um, you know, because Trump at that point is sort of riffing and going off script. But I think that what we saw today and sort of the cleanup and the controversy surrounding the bloodbath comment is a preview of what we'll see in 2024 as Democrats are going to try to seize on every single thing Trump says to try to paint him as an extremist, outlandish, you know, potential uh, danger to the country. And we saw the Biden campaign put out an ad today just uh, sort of making that case. We heard uh, from Donald Trump today, his legal team, that he will likely not have the money to post bond uh, in this New York civil trial that he's dealing with, the fraud trial. Um, Significant for someone who has promoted themselves as a billionaire, but we know this is a campaign that is bleeding cash. How bad is the situation for him as he looks at what could be the longest or will be, general election campaign in modern history? That's a great question. So we're going to see what the Trump campaign, how much money they've actually raised Mm -hmm. when the Federal Election Commission, the the deadline to get those numbers is midnight Wednesday. So we'll have a real sense of how much money they've raised. I will tell you, covering the Trump campaign, that they have been on the hunt for money for the past few weeks, ever since he clinched the nomination or, you know, they thought he was coming close to it. Mm -hmm. He's been hosting dinners at Mar-a-Lago for people. His fundraiser and himself have been making tons and tons of calls you know, reaching out to donors across the country. I've talked to a lot of Wall Street people who have gotten calls. And so I would say right now is a moment when, you know, they're trying to merge the campaign and the Republican National Committee and those staffs, but they're also on the hunt for big dollars. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And of course, we know that former President Trump has had a lot to say, specifically when it comes to congressional and executive branch efforts to deal with the border. And once again, Mike, we seem to find ourselves in a situation in which the border is the issue specifically when it comes to funding the government beyond Midnight Friday, or at least 75 percent of it, because there's six bills that are necessary. And one, the Department of Homeland Security bill, seems to be what we're all hung up on. Well, and it's holding up everything else as usual. And the distance between the two parties over the border remains great. And the uh, at hand is Democrats' concern that what Republicans are demanding uh, is too extreme. Republicans, on the other hand, are seeing in this border security, you know, f- w- the funding for border security in this legislation at hand um, could encourage more migrants to come by offering more uh, detention facilities and, and services, including migrant care. Uh, so, look, we, we were supposed to see this uh, text of the bill on Sunday. We were maybe hoping to see it today. It's not going to be today. 
Tomorrow is Tuesday. The House is back. We have until Friday, as you said in the opener. So they are cutting it very, very close. So as Joe, you said at the top, it may come down to an extension of government funding, or we could even see a short shutdown if uh, if they can't get their act together. Well, you dance on the edge long enough, you might end up falling off at some point, even if it's for a couple of days. We'll find out together here on Bloomberg. And our thanks, as always, to Bloomberg's Nancy Cook and Michael Shepard for getting us started here on Balance of Power. Coming up, former President Trump responding to criticism of his use of that word, bloodbath, at a rally in Ohio over the weekend. Frank Luntz will join us to talk about this coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, we're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line, and you're not going to be able to sell those cars. If I get elected, now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. All right, so there you have it. Donald Trump talking to supporters in Ohio Saturday comments that rocketed across the political spectrum as he used the word bloodbath. What did he mean? The former president responding today to criticism, to, to truth social, as he's been known to do, and writes, the fake news made a big deal out of the word bloodbath, knowing that it was about our shrinking auto manufacturing business and the fact that they use the same name all of the time. They are so bad, exclamation point. We're joined now to consider the political implications and the way the media has handled this uh, by pollster Frank Luntz. He's the founder and CEO of FIL Inc. It's great to see you, Frank. We've had a big talk the last 24 hours about context and how dare people uh, like us bring this up knowing that this was about the auto sector. But I guess I would ask you if that's true, in what world is there any appropriate context to be talking about a bloodbath in the wake of January 6th? It's a great question, a great subject, a great debate, and how Really pathetic it is that we're in this, in the middle of this right now. It's not what you say that matters. It's what people hear. And the fact is there are millions of voters across the country that heard the word and thought, what exactly does he mean? I trust him in his word that he meant it about the auto industry. But the very fact that people were confused tells you the situation that we're in right now, both that he uses language that is is over-caffeinated and can be misinterpreted, and that we're also extremely sensitive right now to everything that people utter. And that at a time like this, it's even more important than ever that we be careful about the language that we use. I'm even in this interview, I'm speaking a little bit more slowly because, because I'm trying to measure my words to make sure I, I articulate this exactly as I mean. That has not been a trait of Donald Trump not just over the last three years, but over the last uh, eight years. I do think he was misinterpreted. But the fact that he allows himself to be in that situation is something that he should pay attention to. And we all know that he doesn't. Well, you say he's misinterpreted, Frank, and it depends on how the person receiving uh, his comments interprets it. But isn't it true that a large portion of America has already decided what way they feel about f former President Trump as an individual and therefore how they are likely to interpret things that he says for his supporters. This likely was more evidence that the media is working against him, trying to spin his comments into something that he did not intend. On the other side, it's a sign that he's a danger to democracy. And I just wonder how big the group is of individuals who are likely to be more considerate of what it's it is he's saying, trying to decipher it and make up an opinion. It's very small. It represents perhaps 5% of the population. Even when people say they're undecided, it's not true. So right now, if you give all the different options, that you can vote for Bobby Kennedy, that you can vote for a new uh, no-labels candidate, a different independent candidate, or, um, or some of these smaller parties, even when you do that, the percentage of undecided is 5%. But the truth is, it may even be smaller because they may not have decided who they're going to vote for, but they have definitely decided who they're going to vote against. And let's say that that is 4%.
There are only eight states that are in play right now. So it's 4% of the vote times the eight states. And that represents literally 1% of America who is going to determine the next president of the United States. When it is that mm -hmm. small a group, surely you should be more careful with your language. Surely you should say things that aren't necessarily meant to inflame. They can still agitate. They can still be direct and honest and crystal clear. But to use a word like bloodbath, it, it just, it's not necessary. And yet this is part of his campaign. And it's what those who would like to vote for him because they agree with his policies, it's what's giving them hesitation because they don't agree with his persona. And I want to emphasize that. There is a segment of America that would absolutely vote for Donald Trump because they think he was a better president than Joe Biden. But they won't vote for him because they are, they are afraid or insulted by how he carries himself. You know, we saw a fascinating number, uh, Frank, in an Emerson poll. Emerson polling came out looking at Ohio. Eight percent of Trump voters there said they would actually vote for Sherrod Brown, the Democrat, their own senator here. And maybe there's some personal feeling about it. But we talked as well about coattails and something that we might consider reverse coattails in this case. Spencer Kimball from Emerson Polling talked about the way passion is working almost in an upside down fashion on the ballot. Here's what he said. What's interesting is that while Biden might lack enthusiasm on the top of the ticket, these other Democratic candidates like Sherrod Brown, as you mentioned, has more enthusiasm. So it's almost as if these down ballots might be able to carry Biden over the finish line in some of these states. Is that a phenomenon that you're seeing, Frank? Yes, but it plays differently in each state. So a state like Montana, West Virginia, Trump's overwhelming popularity is going to help the candidates beneath him. And there are two important Senate races. And, and so often people forget that who controls the Senate determines who controls the hiring, the uh, approval process, the, the vetting process for Supreme Court, for the administration, for the ambassadors. And that in some states that benefits the Republicans. In other states where Trump is not as popular, you're going to have Republicans trying to run ahead of him and maybe running separate from him. But that still doesn't change the, the fact that the intensity, as you correctly note, is so strong on both sides that there were very, very few people who are undecided. And a simple misuse of a word or phrase could determine the election outcome. Frank, just quickly, we only have a minute left with you, but in Ohio in particular, as we're talking about a vulnerable incumbent in Sherrod Brown, depending on who wins the primary there tomorrow on the Republican side, how does that change Brown's odds? Who could he most easily or struggle most to beat? Well, I've heard the argument that he wants to run against a Trump-endorsed candidate, and yet I've seen Bernie Moreno, that individual, and man, he is a good campaigner. He's got this incredible uh, give and take with voters. You may disagree with Trump's endorsement, but as a candidate, as someone who's going to be heard, the people of Ohio can connect with someone who, like them, worked hard, played by the rules, exceeded expectations in his career as a businessman, a very successful one. And so while you may be focusing on Trump, his endorsement, Bernie Moreno I think is actually the best of the three candidates. And he's the one that Sherrod Brown should be most afraid of in November. All right, Frank Luntz, always great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Joining us, of course, from FIL Inc. Now coming up, the Supreme Court hearing arguments today in a key First Amendment case relates to social media. We'll have the details with Tyler Kendall next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. The Supreme Court today heard oral arguments in a First Amendment case experts say could have implications for the 2024 election. Murphy versus Missouri is a lawsuit against the Biden administration. It focuses on the government's communications with social media companies and whether the alleged conduct went too far in trying to counter disinformation online. Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall joins us now from the Supreme Court with the details. Tyler. 
Hey, Kaylee, the name Murthy in this case might sound familiar because that's Vivek Murthy, the U.S. Surgeon General. He's one of numerous Biden administration officials being sued over allegations. They crossed the line when it came to trying to tamp down and combat misinformation online. A group of social media users, along with two Republican attorneys general from Louisiana and Missouri, are alleging that key agencies within the Biden administration, like the CDC, essentially coerce big tech companies like Meta's Facebook and the platform formerly known as Twitter, now X, to take down posts that it disagreed with. A lot of the content in question here has to deal with the pandemic, such as the origins of COVID-19 and the efficacy around vaccines, but it also extended beyond that. For example, posts related to the validity of the 2020 election results. So the big question here is how far can the government go to encourage social media companies in their content moderating decisions and whether or not that can veer into censorship? I spoke to one expert who said there is a fine line when it comes to persuasion versus coercion. Take a listen to what he told me. What the court has to do in this case is to draw a line that polices the government and make sure the government isn't coercing or trying to censor content with which it disagrees, while at the same time allowing the government to provide facts or provide information that allow platforms to make better moderation decisions. The government is appealing the last ruling. That was from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which found the Biden administration asked for a specific post to be removed and pressed the companies to change their content moderation policies. The court felt officials threatened legal consequences if there wasn't compliance, such as reforms to liability under Section 230 and antitrust enforcement. The government says it's entitled to share information, particularly when it's in the public's safety interest. And they also say that there was no co Coercion. Now, I want you guys to take a listen to one of the key conservative justices today saying, uh, signaling that he's reluctant to impose any restrictions when it comes to the government's communications with social media companies. Take a listen here. And my experience is the United States in all its manifestations uh, has regular communications with the media to talk about things they don't like or don't want to see or complaining about factual inaccuracies. Now, Joe and Kaylee, we're not expecting a decision in the. But of course, that just takes us closer to November and the general election. All right, Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall. We thank you, Tyler, for bringing that to us. And we'll let you know what happens in this case. Coming up, we'll be joined by Aaron David Miller, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Senior Fellow, as we continue the conversation about our relationship with Israel the president's policies in Israel and Gaza. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. The two leaders discussed the latest developments in Israel and Gaza, and they spoke about the state of Israel's military operations. The president emphasized his bone-deep commitment to ensuring the long-term security of Israel, and the president has repeatedly made the point that continuing military operations need to be connected to a clear strategic endgame. That was Jake Sullivan, U.S. National Security Advisor, earlier today discussing details of a call between President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister. Benjamin Netanyahu, the first time they'd spoken in over a month. Let's bring in now Aaron David Miller, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace Senior Fellow, who is joining us now. Aaron, thank you so much for being with us. Jake Sullivan also said today that the president warned a major ground operation in Rafa would be a mistake. But I wonder how far warnings go if they don't come with consequence. Would Netanyahu really face any consequence for not abiding by the words of the Biden administration? Uh, thanks for having me, Kelly. Look, the key here is Netanyahu is not a lone actor. He's backed up by the vast majority of the Israeli public, who uh, probably are in favor of a ground campaign in Rafah to deal with the last four battalions of Hamas's organized military structure and to close down the tunnels that link Rafah to Sinai. Um, he's also going to be supported by Betty Gantz, who is a member of the War Cabinet, perhaps according to the polls, a putative uh, successor prime minister if, in fact, elections were held today. 
So he's not a lone actor here. I, I, I think, though, that um, the fact that the uh, administration is going to receive and the Israelis are willing to send a senior delegation to talk about alternatives to a ground campaign, or at least to give the Israelis a chance to explain precisely what they intend to do and how they intend to deal with the reality of a military cam campaign in and among uh, 1.3 million people sandwiched into a tiny slice of Gaza, which is only twice the size of the District of Columbia. So your, your question is absolutely right. I, I think that the Biden administration has been following what I call a passive aggressive policy toward Israel. A lot of tough talk, a lot of genuine anger, understandably, but with little um, intention, it seems to me so far, six months of this war to impose a significant cost or consequence on Israel. How about the relationship between these two men, Aaron, Joe Biden and Benjamin Netanyahu, at the beginning of the conflict when the White House was starting to get criticism here? Joe Biden said you just have to hug him as closely as you can. Uh, they didn't talk in over a month, we were told uh, at today when this meeting took place. Will it be another month before they speak again? Uh, good question, Joe. Um, I, I think the president is is, is increasingly uh, aware of the fact that he's not dealing with the old risk averse Benjamin Netanyahu, the guy who took one step forward, a step to the side, one step back. Biden's now dealing with a <clears throat> excuse me a risk ready Benjamin Netanyahu who, who's on trial for bribery, fraud, and breach of trust, who's desperate, who understands that when this war ends without a significant victory, if that is the case that he is uh, due for an accounting um, on behalf of the opposition and the, and the public of Israel, who's going to hold him responsible for the worst terror attack uh, in Israel's history and the bloodiest day for Jews since the end of the Nazi Holocaust. So I think that Biden, I think it's a broken relationship, frankly, and I think Netanyahu, eager to play to Republicans and to the presumptive Repub Republican nominee as the uh, 2024 presidential election campaign heats up. It would not surprise as it as it, as it did in 2015 when uh, then Prime Minister Netanyahu interceded and undermined then President Barack Obama and his efforts to reach a nuclear agreement with Iran. I think you could see a repeat of that in the months ahead. It's interesting you raise the idea that he may be held in the books of history is responsible for what happened on October. October 7th. And I wonder also if he would want the responsibility on his shoulders of the remaining hostages still being held by Hamas to not come home by not reaching some kind of temporary ceasefire agreement with all of these parties still trying to negotiate toward that effort. Is it, it can it happen if it hasn't happened already? Does it just get more complicated, more difficult to reach that point as time goes on and potentially there is movement in Rafa? There's more frustration on the part of the Biden administration? We have 134 hostages, Kaylee. 30 uh, or more of them, the Israelis believed, were either killed on October 7 and brought to Gaza uh, their bodies to trade for the rest of Palestinian prisoners or killed in, in captivity. I think the prime minister is under pressure, certainly from the families. And here's where Benny Gantz, who has been pushing for a hostage deal uh, for months now, uh, may come into play. If, in fact, the negotiations are now ongoing in Qatar, uh, with the Americans, maybe not yet with the Americans, between the Israelis, the Qataris, the Egyptians, and representatives of Hamas, I think if there's a reasonable deal on the table, there is a chance, perhaps before the end of Ramadan, to get a limited hostage release. Probably 35, 40, the women, the elderly, and the infirm, in exchange asymmetrically, probably for several hundred Palestinian prisoners, and one of the sticking, one of the contention points is that Hamas wants at least a hundred of those to be uh, Palestinians who were either charged or convicted of killing Israelis, which is going to be a tough sell uh, for the Israeli prime minister. So I think there is very much uh, the possibility of such a deal, and I think the administration we're kind of in a race. Are we going to get an Israeli hostage deal uh, before the end of Ramadan, or are we going to get a ground campaign in Rafah? Uh, I think those are the competing trends, uh, and I'm hoping for the former. Well, if we did get the former, then, Aaron, would it forestall the latter? Would that mean no need for an invasion of Rafa if the terms of that ceasefire were appropriate? You know, Hamas will be left with 50 hostages, 
uh, male mm -hmm. civilians and um, members of the Israeli Defense Forces. Those 50 hostages are Hamas's insurance card. And what Hamas will want to trade would be more Palestinian prisoners, but even more withdrawal, significant redeployment of Israeli forces uh, from Gaza, and some sort of permanent ceasefire. If, even if the Israelis were, uh, were, could be persuaded to agree to a permanent ceasefire to get, to get those hostages back, uh, I think Israel has every intention, as, as they did in the wake of Munich after the uh, killing of uh, 11 Israeli athletes by uh, a Fatah's Black September Palestinian group, the very intention of uh, identifying, and, identifying and hunting down um, the key architects of the October 7 terror surge. So even a limited deal or one that would trade uh, final hostages is not going to secure um, a stable uh, Gaza. We're in for some very tough months uh, ahead. Aaron, thank you for joining us. Aaron David Miller, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. It's good to talk with you, as always. Coming up, former President Trump trying to clarify the bloodbath comment over the weekend. And our political panel will react next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. It's not what you say that matters, it's what people hear. And the fact is there are millions of voters across the country that heard the word and thought, what exactly does he mean? I trust him in his word that he meant it about the auto industry, but the very fact that people were confused tells you the situation that we're in right now, both that he uses language that is, is over caffeinated and can be misinterpreted over caffeinated. Pollster Frank Luntz talking with us a short time ago, founder and CEO of FIL Inc., reacting to Donald Trump's controversial bloodbath comments on Saturday. This is from a speech in Ohio, and joining us now, our political panel. Back with us, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. Great to see you both with us. Hope you had a, both had a great St. Patrick's Day weekend. Um, this is somewhat exhausting already. We're going to do this for eight months, apparently. We're getting a lot of emails and tweets from people who don't like the way the media are handling this particular story. Uh, and we're all about context at Bloomberg. We've tried to play the president, former president's remarks in full, even if he was talking about the auto industry. Is that a reason to be forgiving use of the term like this, considering the climate we're in? Yeah, I think uh, it's a different standard for Donald Trump, right? I mean, first of all, he doesn't, let, he doesn't have credibility because half of what he says on the stage isn't true, right? And so to then apply a different measure to the, you know, what he says after he gets off the stage, I mean, like, how can you tell what he really meant? He likes to put the hot words out on the table, right? He likes to That's inspire right. people to do things that nobody else would even contemplate. So when he uses terms like that, you have to assume he is sending a message, whether it's specific to uh, auto workers or whether it's specific to his supporters or anybody else. Yep. This is what he does. We shouldn't be surprised, we shouldn't be shocked, but it is a legitimate thing to talk about because we are in a period of enormous amounts of political violence happening in the United States. Mm -hmm. Just last week, the Maricopa County uh, supervisors were attacked by Trump supporters, screaming that this is an insurrection, this is a revolution, they took over the dais, they ran them out of the room, they had to call the sheriffs. Wow. This is the kind of thing that his supporters are doing every single day. If we don't report on it, then it's just enabling folks who are actually out to be more anarchists than political operatives. Well, it raises just kind of the broader specter then, Jeannie, of the concept of civil unrest around this election. And we've seen polling that suggests majorities of Americans do have concerns about violence that may surround the election. Although it's worth pointing out that goes on both sides. This idea that whatever side loses may not take that peacefully. How are you thinking about this as we have eight months to go between now and November? As Rick says, you're already seeing instances of it. Just how how bad could it get? 
You know, I think I'm not alone in thinking it could get very bad. And of course, language like Donald Trump was using over the weekend sort of further enforces that idea. But you know, what I was really thinking when I heard what he had to say is there's a new book out called White Rural Rage, which the two authors, um, respected uh, a reporter and, and a scholar, talk about the research on rural supporters, um, in particular of Donald Trump, and the rage that they have long felt. And the idea is that Donald Trump, Trump channels that rage. And so, you know, I understand what the viewers Joe was talking about is saying, because the, the frustration that a lot of people feel is that his supporters are in on this joke. They want they want people who they see is in the establishment, and that includes the media, to be all shocked and surprised by what he has to say. Um, and, and that is really a problem that we're going to see, and that's why he continues to play this game. So I think we should also focus an equal amount of attention on the policies that he's talking about. A hundred percent tariff on automobiles. Is, this is a man talking about Joe Biden's economy, which is one of the strongest in the world. What would that do to our economy? That's one of the most important things that we buy in our lifetimes besides a house and one of the most expensive, a car, and he's going to put a tax on it for 100 percent. So let's equal this out with a focus on the policies as well. Well, we can also refer to some of the other things that were said in that speech. It was a stem winder here. Um, you know, so much attention is paid to the bloodbath. The tariff doesn't get the coverage that it deserves, if that's even real. But he also talked about the border and used references uh, to immigrants uh, that might have been new level here, uh, telling supporters that other countries are sending gang members to the United States, quote, I don't know if you call them people in some cases, he said. They are not people, in my opinion, going on to refer to migrants as animals. And that's not even getting a notice. You know, this level of prejudice is is phenomenal at any stage of a campaign. But now that That's we're in the, the general election, nominee. So he, he is the nominee of the Republican Party and will be at the convention uh, held later this summer. Uh, it's the first time I've ever seen the Washington Post say, you know, they do these Pinocchios, right? You know, <laughs> yes. so your nose gets longer if you tell a lie. Right. And they add Pinocchios up depending upon how many lies you've told. They did an entire page off of this one rally. I mean, there must have been eight or nine Pinocchios, That's a lot you know, of Pinocchios. That, that came out of that speech. We could talk about that, that rally all year long and uh -huh. not cover all aspects of it that are either offensive or not true. Mm -hmm. And so is this a strategy into itself, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you just drill everything down to the lowest common denominator, where you pit people against one another, then you just divide the room. Okay, here are the people I didn't insult this year, and they're going to vote for me because I told them that it's them versus the others that I have insulted. And that's, yeah. that's the politics that Trump is bringing to the table. And if we ignore it, we ignore it at our peril as a political system. Well, it also begs the question of whether the Biden campaign is, if not outright ignoring it, being a bit too complacent, Jeannie, as we talk about language selection, the idea that he is characterizing entire groups of people in this way. His own vice president that served under his administration within the last several days said that he would not endorse him um, in, in this election cycle. All of these things could be true, and yet he is still winning. When you look at polling across not just uh, the United States as a whole, but in the key swing states that are going to decide this election, what does it say that Biden is still losing right now if the polls are to be believed? You know, I think partly what it says is Biden and his team need to use this huge amount of money. They've had a big fundraising take. It's historic in proportion. They've got to get on the airwaves and start fighting back. They have got to get out there and describe Donald, uh, Donald Trump rather as the threat that he is to American democracy, to our pocketbooks, and to everything else. So, you know, they're going to have to get out there and make the case that he's a threat, and they are going to get have to get out there and make a case that he is a threat to all that Joe Biden has been able to achieve, and there are enormous achievements there. Um, but I think we also have to ask ourselves why it is that this dehumanizing language, the lies and, and the outrageous statements that he makes don't turn off his voters. And the reason is these people feel like the political parties for decades have let them down. They aren't expecting much from Donald Trump except to scream back to the establishment 
that they have been let down and they are screaming back and you you go to those rallies they feel like they are in on a joke at the rest of the expense of the establishment as they describe it and this is going to continue for another eight or nine months it's going to be a long eight or nine months indeed if, if the last just several days is any indication right. Jeannie Shanzano and Rick Davis thank you both and stick with us because coming up we have to talk about the fact that four days from now we're facing another partial government shutdown deadline, and the border is a sticking point. Rick and Jeannie will be back with us shortly. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Lawmakers had planned to release the text of the last batch of spending bills to fund the government last night. And 24 hours later, we still have no text. The hangup is over the Department of Homeland Security funding and the border specifically. Back with us now, Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. And almost as if on cue, Jeannie, we got mm. this afternoon a letter from the House Freedom Caucus that reads in part, the House must put forward an appropriations measure that forces the inclusion of the core elements of H.R. 2, going on to say, we ask you to join us in rejecting the appropriations package or anything similar that would directly fund the Biden administration's disastrous policy. So once again, Jeannie, it seems to be all about the border and whether or not it's because of the House Freedom Caucus or something else. Is the border going to be what causes a shutdown midnight Friday? It absolutely could. And Kaylee, did you just say HR2? Are we actually back to <laughs> HR2? It's, you know, it's mind numbing how this has worked. We are six months almost into the year and they are still battling. But yeah, I suspect if we do have a partial shutdown, even if it's short and it happens Friday night at midnight, it'll be over the border. Huge surprise. And by the way, to all our Republican friends, they could have looked at the Senate bill and passed that and we wouldn't be in this position. But here we go again. And here we go again with a calendar problem. Even if there's a deal tonight and there could be, to Kaylee's point, we keep hearing there's going to be text, but nobody ever seems to finish their homework. You've got a 72 hour rule in the House that's got to go to the Senate. We're going to have a little shutdown this weekend at least, aren't we? Yeah, well, you, what you might get is what they did last time, which is a short term CR, yeah. a couple of days, you know, half a week. Uh, and stick around next week. And that's allowed if it's, it if it's short? Yeah, I think Nobody that... Nobody well, gets fired? I mean, look, the reality is everything's allowed with 300 <laughs> votes, right? And right. they've got 300 votes for getting a bill passed. So mm -hmm. uh, the reality, though, and I just want to remind everybody, like, there was a deal going into the weekend on this package for Homeland Security, mm -hmm. and the people who screwed it up were the White House. They were on the call on Sunday and said, no, 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 we've got to have more money for the border and for beds and, and, and detention facilities. Yeah. And that was a new ask. That didn't exist before. And when that got put on the table, everybody walked away from a deal. So, you know... I know everybody's got blood on their hands, just yeah. to use a blood phrase, since oh, that's the thing to do today. Uh, and, and House Democrats, House Republicans, everybody has dropped the ball on this. But in this case, I think it's the Biden administration overreaching now on, on border because they thought they could catch the Republicans at their own game. Hmm. Oh, we asked for more money and we were denied it. I think they're overplaying their hand, and I think it's going to result in potentially a, a short-term government shutdown. Well. Jeannie, what do you think? Could this backfire for the president? You know, I think it could, but I think when it comes to the border, the White House feels like it was uh, stalled by the Republicans is the kindest way to put it. They didn't go forward when they should have because of the urging of Donald Trump. And so they're going to have to own where we are today. And we also heard over the weekend that they would uh, potentially veto a CR. So I think they feel comfortable that the blame will not lie on their shoulders. And oh, by the way, Republicans agree we need money for the border. So you, they really, really have to move forward on this, and they really shouldn't be pushing back on the White House at this point. It's funny to think you've got members of the administration pitching the 2025 budget plan on Capitol Hill now. At the same time, we're trying to figure out how the heck to finish this fiscal year. Once they get this done, it's going to happen sooner or later, with or without a shutdown. Is the store closed in a campaign year? 
Joe, there's a reason Congress has an approval rating of basically family animals and their staffers. <laughs> um, you know, it's like sub 10 percent in some places. So, yeah, I mean, I think the public gets it with them. And I don't think there's going to be much of an effort between now and Election Day to try and get much more serious legislation passed. You'll yeah. get some work done, but uh, I wouldn't count on seeing that budget pass for 2025 uh, <laughs> before uh, inaugural day. Uh, there you have it. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano with the baseline to start another interesting week in Washington. Kaylee, we're going to have a lot to cover here with the countdown clocks starting between now and Friday. Absolutely. And as always, you can get your updates in the Washington edition newsletter on the terminal and online. And of course, right here on Balance of Power. You said it. Thank you for joining us here on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg TV and radio. We'll see you back here tomorrow.